This is Larry Lawton, and he's an ex-jewel thief. Larry's a former career criminal, once considered the biggest jewel thief in the United States. All right, everybody, here we go. Gangster Redemption, Chapter 15, the beginning of the Reality Check program. This is going to be pretty good. Some people won't like it because it doesn't have the harder prison stuff, but just a little program note you're going to love. We are having the harder prison stuff. I'm starting the untold stories this following upcoming week. Let's go right to the beginning of the Reality Check program. You know, I left off last time I talked to that kid, and that was great. Now I'm out. I'm home. And you don't realize what you're missing when you're you're, you're free. I mean, people right at home, they, they take it grant for granted. How about taking a shower with no shower shoes? I know it sounds like, wow, big deal. What do you mean? Try that. If you had to go to a shower for the last 11 straight years and you had to put shower shoes on, because you don't want to be in that shower when some other guy's jacking off in that shower or whatever they're doing beforehand. It's dirty. It's scummy. It's just, you don't want that. Man, I get the skeeves on that. So anyway, you know, I'm living large. I'm at my parents' house. I'm in Central Florida. And I, my parents have a small house. They have an 1,100-square-foot house. You know, I told you my dad passed from the Alzheimer's. My mother's still alive, and I do help my mom. And I love her dearly, man, right from my heart. Anyway... I'm living large. I'm an 11, 1100 square foot house. I got a room, my own bedroom, and it's a 10 by 10 room and no bars on the on the windows, no bars on the door. I can leave anytime I want. The littlest things made me so happy. Getting up at night, being able to go to the refrigerator and get a glass of milk. I still do that. Or oh, almond milk now. I like that almond milk. Now, just the littlest, craziest stuff you take for granted when you're away for so long and now I'm like inundated with it and I'm loving it the littlest things are making me happy how about not having to kill a dude for a tv clicker a remote I mean believe it or not you go crazy and that's exactly what would happen it would be nuts you know just for a tv clicker you know it it would drive you nuts you know so I'm living good I'm in 11 foot a square foot house helping people I needed help I didn't know what a computer was when I went to prison, a computer was nothing but a, uh, they had what they call a phone modem, and yeah, it's called a dial-up phone modem. So I had all of that, and I had the best back then, I mean, you know, before I went away. But it, I, I laugh at myself now because now, you know, I tried to give my computer back, I was in prison about two or three years, and I tried to give my computer, which I paid 5000 bucks for, tried to give it to my son. He's now about nine years old, maybe 10 years old. He said to me, Dad, I don't want that. That's not, that's no good. Like, what do you mean? It's a $5,000 computer. It was like an anchor. He said it's worth nothing because, you know, technology changes so much. And I'm in prison during all of the big changes. From 1996 to 2007 was some of the biggest changes in technology from phones and computers, all that kind of stuff. So anyway... I didn't know how to even turn on a computer. Laptop. What's a laptop? Anyway, I get a computer. And I need my nephew, Brendan, to help me run the PowerPoint, do whatever it is, learn how to even log on. At that time, just getting emails. Uh, AOL email was in the beginning. A big thing. You have mail from AOL with some of the older people who are listening. will check that out. You young people will have no clue what I just said. But here I am, um, uh, my nephew, who's 24 years old and since passed away. And that's a tragic tragic story. I'll probably talk about it sometime. Anyway, my, my nephew who passed away taught me how to kind of work a PowerPoint, work a computer a little bit, and, and it was great. I mean, here I am. I'm like, you talk about the Internet. When I went, to, went away, there was no Internet. Now, the Internet. It's amazing what you can do on a computer that you couldn't do back when I went to prison. So, so much have changed. So, the more I'm talking to kids, and I know, and it's getting me frustrated that kids think prison is a joke. A lot of kids thought prison is a joke. Oh, I could be a tough guy. I can get my stripes, or 
I could feel, you know, like I did my time. I can join this group or that group or whatever it is. And you want to talk about Get Me Mad. I used to watch that show Lock Up. It's still on today. I don't know if anybody out there watches it. It's called Lock Up. It's on uh, one of the news shows. I think MSNBC Lock Up. And whenever I see that show, I get mad. You know, I, I literally get mad. And I could scream. My mom says to me, "What are you? what's going on? I said, Mom, it's bullshit. They're talking about bullshit. In lockup, they don't show you when the guards piss on you or beat you or spit in your food or shut your toilet water off. They don't tell you that. They don't say a thing about that. They only show the bad inmates that are doing bad. They don't show where people really help each other. How about another dude trying to help another guy get out of prison, which I did. You know, I got a great question on that. Uh, one of the comments, have you ever helped somebody get out of prison? And I have, and a truly innocent dude. So, you know, there are good things that go on in prison. Obviously, it's a zoo. There's rapes and fighting and stabbings. And, and I'll, I'm going to be talking a lot about that in the whole prison series. But the, the lockup show always makes the inmates look like psychopaths, the worst of the worst. And I get what it is, a TV show. I wanted to do a TV show. And I actually, at the time, this is way back in 2008, and I actually was interviewed by uh, A&E. I think they're one of the parent shows that had that show on. And they said, well, you can't do that, Larry. You can't talk about the guards because they won't let us in the prison. And I got so, fuck this, man. How can you not talk about the truth that goes on in prison? Of course, they don't want it because they don't want to be exposed for the, for the nastiness that goes on in prison. And it's wrong. And in my mind, it's wrong. It's totally wrong. So anyway, I was getting mad a lot of time, but I'm, I'm lucky. So here I am out of prison and I, get, I hook back up with my friend Dennis Broderick. Now, Dennis and I grew up together in the Bronx. We were street kids. We would be robbing stores in the street. We would be fighting. We'd be drinking. We'd be drugging. We did everything in the streets of the Bronx, New York. Uh, he, Dennis was, to this day, is one of my best friends. What a powerful kid, too. Here, his dad uh, got killed in a robbery. And if you know, at 12, he was 12 years old when that happened. And Dennis, Dennis never, ever, to this day, ever judged me. And, you know, he really helped me so much in, in this whole entire process of me getting out of prison. Because Dennis found out I got out of prison and he hooked right back up with me. He didn't even know all the bad things that happened to me or anything like that. So what does he do? He buys me a pair of golf, uh, a set of golf clubs. I'm a golfer. I love golf. When I, I mean love golf, that's my game. Uh, I used to be pretty good, but I love golf. To this day, I'm about a 10 or 11 handicap. Anybody knows about golf. But anyway, Dennis buys me golf clubs. We start talking all the time. And we're going to Harmony Golf Course. That's in, It's outside of Orlando. And it's a beautiful golf course. So Dennis and I are going there. You talk about how he breaks me of something. So every day, Dennis and I would go. And we're not, not every day, but we'd golf on the weekends. And maybe a day in between, we'd sometimes sneak away. And he bought me my clubs. I didn't have money for anything. Dennis never asked me for anything. He knew I didn't have anything. And he never made me feel bad. So anyway, every, here's a funny thing because I'll never forget how this started. Dennis always would eat a hamburger, no bun, no anything on it. Uh, it was just the blandest thing in every, it, it made you laugh. Now it makes me laugh. But I couldn't make a choice. If you remember, I was telling you how a, an inmate can't make choices because a dude who's been in prison for a long time, he makes 100 choices a day. Today, you and I are going to make 15 to 1,800, 2,000 choices today. What are you going to wear? Where are you going to go? All, a whole ton of things. Well, in prison, that doesn't happen. So here I am in prison, uh, out of prison, and I'm going to golf with Dennis. And after golf, we sit down and we have lunch. And every time the wait, wait, waitress would come over, Dennis would give his order, and I would say, I'll have what he has. So we do it all the time. I'll have what he has. Dennis noticed this, and Dennis stopped me one time and says, hold on. He says, told, I'll, I'll never forget. He told the, the girl, hold on. He goes, Larry, he goes, I want you to read the menu, and I want you to order what you want. 
Just order what you want. You know, your first thought, my first thought was, what do you think, I'm stupid, I can't read, I don't know what I'm doing. He, it wasn't that at all. He saw that I was struggling with making this choice. I don't know how he knew about it. I don't know why. I mean, obviously, all the time we're together and I'm eating the same shit he's eating. And it was just, to this day, I, I mess with him because how messed up that, that what he eats is. And so Dennis said, we're going to sit here until you read that menu and you make an order what you want. And I will tell you what, I will never forget because that had changed my life right then and there because I was institutionalized to a very big degree and Dennis broke that. He helped me make my own choice. He broke something that was, in, again, ingrained into me in a bad way. And now, obviously, as you can tell, how fat I am and all the stuff that happened. But Dennis really, truly helped me on that. I'll never forget that, you know. And to this day, you know, I see him. We talk for a long time. I got to, matter of fact, I got to go golf with him. That's going to be put on my schedule as busy as I am. So anyway, we're going. And I'm. this is a great story because I'll tell you how messed up. But here it is. Dennis's birthday is in December, the end of December. So... We used to golf all the time, so his birthday, this was a Saturday morning, and we're going to be going golfing on his birthday, and we're going to meet at the Denny's. There's a Denny's, well, Harmony Golf Course was about 45 minutes from my house, so it was a, like a ways out. We live on the coast of Florida, and Harmony Golf Course is heading east towards the Orlando, So, but Dennis and I were going to meet at the Denny's. At 7 or 6.30, 6.30 in the morning, even early. I think we had a 7 o'clock tea time. So we were going to meet even 6 o'clock. We are going to meet real early. So it was real early we were going to meet. So we are going to meet at 6 o'clock, eat for a half hour, shoot out to our tea time. Because it was about 20 minutes from the Denny's to the golf course. And I think we had a 7.05 tea, whatever it was. So we go, and that's, that's, that's our plan. So what does Larry do? Larry gets up at 4.45 in the morning. I figure I'm going to go get Dennis a birthday card at the Walmart because I had to go buy a Walmart, which is in my neighborhood, and there was a 24-hour Walmart, and I'm going to go buy the Walmart. So I said, okay, I'm going to do that. I'm going to get the, I'm going to do that. I'm going to get the, get him a birthday card, and, uh, you know, that. what can I do? I don't have money, and I'm just going to get him a birthday card. So... I'm pulling out in my area. There's a road, Palm Bay Road. It's a pretty pretty busy road. And I come from the back of that road, and I come up to the light. Now, you got to remember, I'm in my old dad's blue Skylark. It's got a dent on the side. It's a 1994 Skylark. Here we are in 2007. It was the end of 2007. I'm out of prison only three months. So I pull up to a light, and all of a sudden, a cop car pulls right in front of me with its lights on. Now, it's on a main drag. It pulls right in front of me. And I'm like this. Over the loudspeaker, says, pull over to the parking lot. There was a 7-Eleven there. So he pull, I pull into the 7-Eleven. I'm wondering, what did I do? I'm nervous. I'm only out of prison three months. I'm thinking, what did I do? I didn't do anything. My plates are good. I'm, I'm just nervous now. I'm getting nervous. So he pulls out, and another cop car pulls up. Okay, now they're talking... And the one car, cop, cop, cop walks on the passenger side. The other cop pulls up to over here. And they said, license and registration. So I give him everything. I have a license. I have registration. I have insurance. I give him the paperwork. And they walk back. Now I'm, I'm sitting here. What did I do? I'm, I'm, I didn't know anything. I mean, I, I'm try, my brain is going crazy. So what happens? Another cop car pulls up. What? Another cop car pulls up. Now there's four cop cars, and I'm like, what? What the fuck? I, I, my, I'm, I'm sweating. I'm thinking of running. I didn't do anything, but I'm thinking of running. I don't want to get arrested for whatever they're going to do. I don't know what's going on. I'm like, holy shit. I'm, the shit that was going through my mind will blow you away. Anybody who gets out of prison is going to be like that. So all of a sudden, a fifth cop car pulls up. What the hell's going on? And I'm like, really? I'm I'm thinking it's so much crap is going through my brain. What do I do? How do I get out of this? Can I if I go? I'm thinking of ways to escape, and I didn't do anything wrong. So all of a sudden, 
they all get out of their cars and I'm, I'm like, now I know they know I'm an ex-con. You know they ran the plates. I'm like, I'm, I'm done. What am I going to do now? So all of a sudden, cops, call, pull, cops will pull up on the right side, two, got, two cops, and all of a sudden a civilian gets out of a car, one of the cop cars, and he walks up to the side of my car with another cop. So three, two cops on that side, two cops on this side, and I... And I'm in the car, and my hands are on the wheel because I was scared. I mean, literally. And he walks up. A guy looks in the car, and he says, that's not him. I mean, I could tell you what happened. So the guy, the cop goes, wait here. And I, I'm sitting there. The guy turned around. Cops are all there. Cop comes up and gives me my license and registration and insurance and says, okay, you can go. You can go. What the fuck? I end up finding out later that uh, the other 7-Eleven down a little bit, another few corners down, it was another 7-Eleven. It was robbed. It was just robbed. And the description of the car was somewhat of the car I had. So that they didn't know if they had the, the robber at that point. And, you know, you want to talk about thinking about crazy stuff and think about this right now. What happens if that 7-Eleven was robbed by a guy who was bald, had a goatee, kind of big guy, and that owner, or that, it was a clerk actually, looked in and said, uh, might have been him. What do you think would have happened right then and there? They would have dragged me out of that car. Who knows what they would have did to me, whether it's beat me or whatever, throw me in a cop car. Who's going to believe An ex-con is getting up at 4.45 in the morning to go play golf somewhere and did not rob this this jewelry store, uh, uh, 7-Eleven. So you want to talk about, I mean, screwed up. In fact, I left that place. I went to to the Denny's and I walked into the Denny's and Dennis said to me, he goes, what happened? You look like you, you saw a ghost. I was literally shaking and sweating. Yeah, I was just out of prison for three months. I got out on August 24th of 2007. Here it is, December 23rd. I think his birthday is the 23rd. So I'm not even out of prison three months. August, September, October, November. Three months, three and a half months. And I am freaked out, man. I'm not kidding you. I was shot for the rest of the day. I mean, things that were going through my mind, I'm, I'm not going back to prison. I, no way. I'm going to fight them. I can't do it. And, and I didn't do anything. And that's the kind of mentality that's going through your mind. So we go golfing that day. And uh, Dennis says to me, he goes, Larry, you got to you know meet my wife. I met her a couple of times, but my wife wants to talk to you. And they work with at-risk kids, whether they're slow adults or slow slower with disabilities or sometimes trouble kids who can't get along with other kids and they help them get jobs and stuff like that. And she also taught in a school. She taught a class for these guys in uh, Bayside High School. I'll never forget, Bayside High School. So she asked me, she said, hey, Larry, can you come speak to my students at Bayside High School? Sure, absolutely. I was speaking to other people already after helping that person. So that was what I did. I love that. And I said, sure. So I go into her class and there's a rowdy bunch of kids there. You know, they're high school age, probably juniors or whatever, whatever level. They weren't seniors, but they were up there. And might have a few of them. Some of them are 20 years old because these are the kids who got in trouble, didn't graduate and slow or whatever it was. So I walk into this classroom of rough kids and the first words out of my mouth was, can anyone in this room hide a knife up your ass? The room gets, first they giggle. <laughs> and they look like, and I'm not giggling. And it, it, it gets quiet. I says, well, I did it. I had to do it to survive. Can you do it? Because if you can't, you're not going to survive where I just came from. That's how I open it. That's, how, that's the truth and that's how I tell it. Can you hide a knife up your ass? I get kids and young people today who went through my program 10 years ago and say, man, I'll never forget Larry Lawton because he say, he told me that, or they'll talk about the story about the young man who got his anus cut with a sharp object from the top of his anus to his scrotum 
and seminal fluid was found. And they remember that story. So if you want to talk about pretty wild, that's pretty wild. So anyway, uh, I go to that school. I start talking to the kids at the school. And I, I don't know what to do. It's doing great. So Dennis, again, my buddy, he's a vice president for Primerica. It's an insurance company and financial company. And he's a vice president. And he says, Larry, he goes, you can use my meeting room. If you want to speak to, to parents, kid, you know, kids, you can uh, use my meeting room. He had a meeting room. What, what, he didn't want money, didn't ask for a thing. And he just said, you can use my meeting room. I mean, you want to talk about like a blessing, Dennis? I mean, so I use his meeting room. I start setting up classes. They're going good. And parents are sending their kids uh, to see me. The word's getting out. So all of a sudden, I get a call from Jean Bandish. Had a, I hooked up with Jean Bandish one way or the other. I called her, she called me, and we hook up, and she says, you want to see, uh, Judge Ryman wants to see you. At first, I don't want to see no judge. I, are you kidding me? Why does Larry want to see a judge? No way. Larry don't want to be in front of a judge, nothing. You got a warrant, I'll see a judge if you got a warrant. Anyway, no, she wants to know what you do. She wants, she heard you talk to kids and stuff of that nature. Her, her name was Judge Morgan Ryman. So she's a nice lady. So Judge Ryman actually had a kid herself, so she understood kids and whatnot. And she was the juvenile judge for Brevard County, Florida, which is the 18th Judicial District in, in Central Florida. And they handle Brevard and Seminole counties. So Judge Ryman says she want to see me. So my nephew helped me with the PowerPoint, so I know how to do a PowerPoint. And I do the PowerPoint, and... I go to see Judge Ryman in her chambers. Now, this is a Friday. I'll never forget. It's a Friday. So I go into the chambers, and I sit down, and there's about four or five or six people in the room, some other juvenile probation officers, uh, other juvenile stuff. I think uh, Crosswinds Youth Service was there. A couple of different ones were there, and Judge Ryman, Gene Bandish, and they're all sitting in there. And they said, okay. So I did like a presentation. I didn't know what I was doing a presentation for. I had nothing solid like I own solid or something to do. So here I am. I do a presentation in judges chambers. We find out later I wasn't even supposed to be in those chambers without a uh, deputy or a bailiff. You call them whatever you want, wherever you're at. In Florida, they have sheriff's deputies. I was not supposed to be in the back of that chambers without a deputy because I'm a convicted felon. And I was on paper at that time. Now I can because I'm not on paper. I'm not on parole. I'm not on anything. So here I am. I, I give a presentation and I had a PowerPoint. I kind of felt proud of myself. I knew what I was doing. And after the meeting, the judge says, would you like to stay for the rest of the meeting? And I said, no, no, no your honor. I, I'd like to leave. And she goes, no, you can leave. Do what you want. Thank you very much. And they all said goodbye. Thank you. And I'm like, I'm out of this chambers of a judge. It's, it, it gives you the willies. Even today, I'm not a big... I have judge friends now, but I'm not... My point is, there's some kind of feeling I'll always get in, in courtrooms. So anyway, this is a Friday. I did partied or whatever I did on a weekend. Golf, probably with Dennis. And oh, here it is, Monday morning. And I get a phone call from Gene Bandish. Gene Bandish says to me, Hey, Larry, I got to give you a heads up. Judge Ryman sentenced two kids to your program. My program? What fucking program? From there, I developed the number one program right now in the United States. We have a 90% success rate of keeping kids out of jail who were rearrested, never rearrested, 90%. 70% of better attitudes. This is from the parents. 43% have better school grades. 31% have better school attendance. That is not done by me. Eastern Florida State College in Central Florida here took my data and ran and did a study on it, a quantitative analysis on my program. And those are the numbers on my program, which I'm very proud of to this day. And I'll talk about it more in the after show. But I'm like, 
wow, these numbers are great. And I'm just doing what I do to you guys right now. I tell the truth. I tell stories. I don't bullshit people. I'm past those times in my life. Uh, you know, listen, you either fucking like me or you don't. And if you don't, you don't. What are you going to do? I mean, I can't, I can't make you like me. And listen, we'll agree to disagree on a lot of things and we'll move on. That's just the way it is. And that's how I feel in life. But anyway, they sent two people on a program. From there, that's when I, I developed the program. I ended up setting the price of the program at $50 for kids. And here's a great story. From there, Judge Silverman. I'm golfing again, golfing with a judge named Judge David Silverman. He's still a judge to this day, and he's a good friend of mine. We're golfing, and I tell him my story, and he says to me, he goes, I I'd like to see the program. I said, sure. Now, he's an adult judge. He works, he's a, he's a county court judge, so he works the misdemeanor division. At that time, he was the misdemeanor judge, so he would sentence people who did like underage drinking, fighting, urinating, misdemeanors. That means up to a year in jail you can face. And usually you get community service or anger management. He used to tell me a funny story. He goes, wow, big deal. I can give him twice, two times anger management. So anyway, the judge himself, he, he's got an intern or a young kid who's clerk and helping clerk for him in this courtroom. And the kid was 16 years old and he gives the kid the tape the video at that time we had dvds now it's all on video it's all in the links and it's all you know specially done so he gives the video to the kid and the kid watches the video the judge says to him, you watch the video and you let me know what you say the kid come back to him and said judge this video is like something you'll never forget it's like the exorcist you can't explain it but you couldn't take your eyes off it and you could not understand it. And to this day, uh, the lieutenant governor of the state of Florida, who at the time was a guy named Jeff Kopkamp, great guy, actually went on TV with me. He said, my program was the best program he's ever seen. And he started the Youth and Family Council for the state of Florida. He said, your program needs to be in every county in the, in the state of Florida and all over the country. We still to this day, and I still do this program. So if you're out there, anybody, and you want the program, just contact my office and I'll work something out and we'll see if we can get into your juvenile and not only a juvenile court, your misdemeanor court. Now we're talking about young people. Just because a person turns 18, what's this, a magical number? Now you're an adult? That's such bullshit. Man, it, this is a fact. Men or young people don't mature their brains till 25 and women about 23. I'm still fucked up. Who are we kidding with all this? Oh, you got to be an adult and all this kind of crap when you're 18. That's all bullshit. It's all numbers. We all make mistakes and we all can use what I call a reality check. It's called the reality check program. It's the reality check program video. It's the number one video. It's recognized on the floor of Congress, this video. It's used in, in police agencies. It's used in uh, uh, schools. It's used in... Uh, court system so people get sentenced to it as part of their sentence so there is ways we can use this program in any county or any place in the world actually it's that good so the program is developed the program is founded and i go on a radio show so i go on a radio show now you can understand this so i go on a radio show in a local radio show and i had friends listening and every one of them said larry you're a natural you, you you're a natural storyteller you you're, you're comfortable on the radio you you, you just you, you're good at it and and people ask me all the time they go how do you do that larry and i say listen because i don't give a fuck and they go what do you mean listen i don't care if people like me or they don't it, we all put our pants on the same way we are all the same people no matter whether you're rich and famous or whether you're poor and 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 homeless Everybody is the same. Yes, we all have economic differences. Yes, we all have maybe uh, uh, eth uh, ethnicity differences. But you know what? We're all the same people. And I don't, you know, I don't judge people. I never judge people. That's my biggest positive. I think I don't believe in judging people. Everybody who's to come in my program, I I tell the young people and adults that come to my program, I tell them, listen, I don't care what you did before you got into this room. Now we're, we're, we're going to work on whatever it is that 
that will, why you did what you did, why you made the choices you did, and how to make better choices. And I do that now all the, all the time. And, and when I speak to private groups, I do that. I love to do that. When I go into a business and I talk to the parents because they have messed up kids to help them get better work productivity, you know, the parents come up to me and or the CEOs come up to me and say, listen, Larry, can you see my kid? And I will usually. And I, I'm like that. I, any, I love to help young people. And I work with thousands and thousands of young people. So you get to know young people. You get to know what works and doesn't work. That's what's important. That's why the program works. After I did that radio show, it's funny, I, uh, Karen Locke from Crosswinds Youth Service, to this day she's there and, and I know her, she's a great lady. And so Karen calls me and says, Larry, you know, I'd like to hire you to do a youth group and uh, speak to all these kids. And, I, and they're troubled kids. Youth, they're sentenced also from the courthouse. I said, sure, we'll do something. So I do, and I'll never forget this. So I do a class for her, and there were about 60 young people in the class. What well, what makes me never forget this specific class is there was a little kid. There was about a nine-year-old kid in there. And matter of fact, he was nine. And I asked the kid, Uncle Louie was with me at the time because he, he came. He used to love to watch what I did. So Uncle Louie comes to me, and he... We're looking and we're talking to this little kid. And I go, kitty, he was a little kid, a little guy too, a small nine-year-old, cute little kid. And I said to the kid, I said, hey, what are you, what are you here for? He goes, I, I robbed the bike. And I, I, it just dawned on me. So I started asking him questions. And that is when I realized my program is not made for nine-year-olds. The Reality Check program is made for ages 11 and up. And here's why. At nine years old, you don't understand consequences yet. The difference between knowing right and wrong is big. A kid knows don't don't touch a hand on the stove because you're going to have no fingers, you know, or you're going to burn yourself. But they don't understand what not having feeling in your fingers might mean. A five-year-old knows to don't cross the street. You can get hit by a car. He doesn't understand death. At about 11, a child or any young person starts understanding consequences. And what I mean by that is, if he's 11 years old and you take his phone away for three days, four days, that's a consequence he's going to understand, so he's not going to do something. I work with parents, so if any parents are out there and want to call my office, do stuff, bring me in, we do that. And it is really good. That's when I realized the actual length and and how many times spoke to thousands and thousands of kids and our success rate proves what we're doing is right and this reality check program is the best and how i deliver it i guess makes it makes a big difference as well and that is what i know so that is where i uh realized what i was doing so now that i got this thing off the ground the next chapter is going to be how to expand it and to try to find an angel or an investor and i end up doing that but that's the end of this chapter right now. And yes, I know some guys out there are going to want the harder chapters. You're getting them. I'm letting you know. Right after I stop filming right now, I'm going to be doing one of my robbery scenes. I'm going to do another uh, robbery scene thing. I'm going to be doing a video next week. I'm doing another gaming video for Payday. Uh, people wanted that, and we're going to try that one. And I'm going to, with my son, so that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, remember, you can listen to all these shows in the links below. Our merchandise is in the, in the link below. Uh, listen, the merch is pretty cool. I mean, I like it. I like my shirt. I like my, my cups. I, I, I wear it. I, I think it's pretty cool. I also want to know, let you know the books are going quick. Uh, we're about halfway done. Maybe more by now. Well, we have definitely more by now. With the limited edition 3,000 books we're doing. And uh, if anybody wants to buy large purchases for schools or something, we can do that. They can email me and we can work something out that way. But this limited edition is just 3,000. I am hand signing, numbering and hand signing them. And that's it, man, because people were getting screwed. Uh, what we do after that for books, it's not going to be signed books and nothing like this. And, we're, and I'm only selling them for $19.99. So I'm not trying to screw people. I'm not trying to do anything like that. 
uh, that's not the way I am. I think everybody who knows this channel knows the way I am, and, and I hope they realize that. I'm going to keep it going just the way it is. I mean, we got so many videos coming, guys. I've been just doing nothing but, but researching my videos, meaning making lists of robberies and scenes, that the, the crimes I committed, how I did it, uh, not only how I did it, really intricacies from the cooking show, uh, prison pasta, making things in prison. There's so many shows coming. I'm doing a live show tomorrow night, so check it out. The live show is going to be 9 o'clock Eastern Time. Thank you. Humbled by everybody out there, and I mean that for all my heart. Thank you very much, everybody. God bless you, man. Make good choices.